Welcome to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast. Many thanks for joining us on the Journal of Biophilic Design today. We're really excited to be joined by Stephen Melvin. He's Principal Director of Atelier Architects, where he creates spaces um, that are connected to nature and also, importantly, the landscape. Biophilic design is at the heart of all of his beautiful spaces. Um, he uses the pioneer nature method, which we're going to hear more about, um, and he listens to and enhances the natural processes. He actually draws nature out of the landscape and the nature out of people. Um, his website is atelier-architects.co.uk. I'll put the link in the Journal of Biophilic Design, also on the YouTube channel and on the RSS feed. So please, if you can, subscribe. But um, Stephen, many thanks for joining us today. Uh, Ness, thanks very much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Lovely. Well, I know when uh, you, you know when we spoke before we recorded this um, that you don't feel comfortable calling yourself an architect, and you have a great term which I love um, called landscape facilitator. Um, can you explain what this actually is, and and actually what it means to you as well? Indeed. Uh, it means guiding the evolution of a landscape, uh, acting as a filter to support the natural processes which were there before we were here and will invariably be here after we're here. Um, my colleague Shinona constantly reminds me that architecture is about as permanent as it can get for our species. Um, therefore, I feel as architects, we have a responsibility to, to think carefully about how we create this permanence or semi-permanence and to tread lightly, um, to show humility and to respect that underlying uh, process of nature which, which uh, will outlive us ultimately. Mm -hmm. um, so it's having sensitivity to that, yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. So can you explain a little bit more about uh, landscape facilitator? I want to sort of drill down a little bit more into that. Maybe a little bit about where you've, you know, your own personal journey and where that's come from, uh, if that's possible. <laughs> so, and relating this also to architecture, um, I had a roundabout route into architecture. Um, I um, studied, uh, or, or yeah, started studying anthropology and then landscape architecture before going into architecture. But anyway, after school, I went traveling in Africa. And whilst prior to that, I was 18 at the time, um, Prior to that, I, I'd had exposure to landscape. My parents had taken me fell walking in the Lake District. I got into rock climbing probably at the age of 12. Um, I used to love the sea, so I love swimming in the sea. My parents used to drive us to Sicily every summer and oh, stop. Wow. Um, so I had exposure to landscape, you know, both natural landscape or if you like, yeah, whatever natural landscape is, but, you know, sort of mountains, but also cities. Um, and... Um, uh, this South African experience, however, showed me the power of landscape. The, the, the landscape has power to transform your state of mind. Uh, and that first photo is about traveling across the Karoo Desert in South Africa uh, from Cape Town towards Durban. Um, and just the enormity of the landscape. And um, also, the, yes, it's huge, but it, it's not scary. It's, it's beautiful and it's inspiring and it's welcoming. I would never feel lonely in a landscape like that. It's like the mountains are talking to each other and, and it's, a, it's a fantastic um, place to be. So yes, I had this South African experience and I started sketching then and making notes. Then I started reading anthropology at UCL and then I transferred into landscape architecture on the back of these experiences I'd had in South Africa. I just felt, you know, uh, inspired by landscape and wanted to work with landscape. The only reason I changed from landscape architecture into architecture, which I did at the end of my first year, um, was because the architecture training seemed to be offering a more comprehensive um, discipline, really, in space and form. Mm. Uh, and I, at that point, never was convinced I would be an architect. I thought, well, you know, I can train in architecture, but still be involved with landscape. So that's ultimately where I am now, I suppose. Yeah. You have a, a spiritual um, meditation training. Um, can you tell, that, tell us how that's informed your approach to the built environment um, and also the spaces you design? 
I mean, how does it inspire you? Um, and maybe you could talk us a little bit about what the spiritual training is, but also how that actually informs your practice. Indeed, there's so you're asking quite a lot there, which mm. I may not take in that uh, logical sequence. I'll probably come back to how I use meditation in my work, but I'll yeah. first of all explain how I stumbled across meditation. Um, it was a, a kind of unique entry, um, random entry in, into meditation through being very ill. Uh, in my 20s, I had undiagnosed ME for a number of years and had very poor medical support and eventually came across a physician at the Royal Free who had a very enlightened approach uh, and understood ME and was renowned for having um, a long waiting list of, of, of people around the country who came to him because he recognized it and gave good advice. And he actually put me onto meditation a particular form of uh, meditation technique, but I think numerous meditation techniques uh, are of similar ilk in their physiological benefits. And he demonstrated that by learning to meditate, this would enable me ultimately to recover and heal from ME. Um, my parents were very skeptical, understandably. I, I was at, um, uh, at the end of the road, really, and just wanted something to work. So I threw myself into it. And over the course of time, a number of years, absolutely, it did unwind uh, the disease and I recovered. Wow. So I actually saw firsthand the benefit of meditation mm -hmm. on physiological disease. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is it introduced me to, um, I'd been brought up in a privileged education in, in the West um, yeah. and, um, and um, you know, very driven academic culture um uh, about uh, achievement and this then experience of meditation um uh got me to look more into the, the, the differences between eastern and western philosophy mm. um, and how uh, very generally speaking uh, eastern culture is, is is centered around being and western culture is around action and achievement mm. and that through the meditation process i was able to bring these two uh opposite forces uh, better into balance. So I, I learned then, if you like, about meditation as healing, meditation as well-being, and to some degree, meditation as sanctuary. Um, that was all very important to my exper experiential um, journey, I think. So at Landscape School, I came across a book uh, on Louis Kahn, um, the Kimball Art Museum in Texas, and uh, was struck particularly by a particular photograph of one of the spaces in the museum, which had a philosophical uh, musing of Louis Kahn's beneath it, saying just the place to be. And I was um, quite inspired by that sense of space of calm and sanctuary. Um, and it's been an influence for me ever since. Um, it is one of the images that I have um, shared with you, but um, yeah, it's about meditation and being really, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you explain the, can you describe the picture for us? So um, I encourage people to look at the, the Journal of Biophilic Design because all these images will be on the uh, page with, the, with, with this podcast and um, will also be on the YouTube channel um, with, with Stephen Mel Melvin. So I also encourage you to have a look there because you can listen to the podcast and, and watch the, the images come up. So, so Stephen, can you explain the, um, the first image to us? Well, I'll, try, yeah, I'll try and paint a, a picture, really. It, it, there's, there's something about the light in the picture, which is amazing. Mm. The roof in the Kimball Art Museum is a barrel vault, which yeah. sheds light in a very special fashion. Um, there's also some, some open space out, outside of this barrel vault, um, and there is a lovely play of light and shadow and different intensities of light and shadow. And there's also a sense of order uh, in the columns and the barrel vault itself. And I think it's a combination of that, that structural order, um, the light, and the, the slightly playful light, which is a little bit out of control, if you like. It's not completely constrained. It, it's allowed to breathe, to move, to, to express itself. There's something beautiful in that, this sense of orderly chaos or, you know, this um, uh, order that presides without constraining um, underlying forces. And I think Khan did that beautifully. Mm, that's gorgeous. It's really lovely. Um, well, I mean, if you could go back and then explain a little bit more about um, how 
that your the the spiritual training influences your um your design process yes, yes. so meditation is natural uh, it's a guided form of being with your thoughts um and for me it, it yes it, it's it's given me physiological recovery from a long illness so mm -hmm. physiological benefit but it's also informed my uh, focus um and um sense of balance um which i can apply in in, in the work environment mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and it, it gives clarity and vitality um and why does it give clarity and vitality i think it's a, it, 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 it's 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 psychologically it's the closest we can get to nature because it's all about the spontaneous occurrence of a thought mm. and if you uh, learn to observe actually your thoughts come spontaneously you don't control how your thoughts come out you you guide them as mm. they arise spontaneously so that fountain of spontaneous thought is uh, psychologically the closest we get to nature's process in my view. yeah that's the lovely way. And I, looking at your images of, of the work that you've done, um, they all seem to have this sort of space and air and time. And um, yeah, it's a meditation, meditative quality about the, you know, actually moving around the buildings, moving around the spaces. There's there's gaps, there's air, there's time to think and breathe. You know, they're very inspirational places. But as you, you know, we're, we're going to talk about how you build from the landscape up if you know what i mean um with the landscape primarily in mind um which is obviously how we, you, we've done it years and years ago i suppose sort of prehistorically we would have looked at where the great place to build a house was and, and then gone from there rather than trying to carve something into something that isn't there um i mean can you um the pioneer nature method which i mentioned at the beginning what yes. is it um and, um, and can you sort of maybe give an example of how it's been implemented, you know, to kind of give an idea and um, people an idea of what this is. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so Pioneer Nature Method is is my method. It's mm. uh, um, uh, and it's a combination of, of my experiences in uh, meditation, climbing uh, and uh, architecture. Mm. Um, what does it mean? It means reconnect people with nature and it's pioneering because our connection to nature has been lost, particularly over the last 400 years since the agricultural revolution mm. and then industrial revolution. Um, so the pioneering is about rediscovery, really, reawakening people's awareness of nature. And I suppose because of my experiences in mountaineering, the pioneer, um, and mountaineering is very central to my life experience, pioneer seems relevant mm. uh, for me. Um, but another uh, two universal definitions of pioneer, which I think are worth sharing with you, one being a willingness to endure hardship, to explore new places or try out new things. That's one definition which I like. Another is uh, pioneer species are those that are the first to colonize an ecosystem. So, yes, uh, th that's the pioneer in in a few words, pioneer nature method. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps another explanation is um, in the spirit of the pioneer, there is this fearless exploration, mm -hmm. fearless sense of exploration on an untrodden path, leading to experiences that I think can be translated into architectural ideas. Um, one to do with, you mentioned the journey, this, uh, but on the journey, there is a sense of unfolding and of discovery mm. uh, and of thrill. And possibly at times, with definitely in mountaineering, there is this perception of drama and danger. Yeah. Um, then, of course, there is problem solving. You're, you're confronted with um, problems and you have this in mountaineering, you have this in architecture. And out of that problem, you have to create a solution, evolve a solution. Um, uh, another reference is balancing conflict or contradiction, where ultimately you want order to prevail. Um, and finally, at a sense of completion, you reach a mountain summit, or in the case of mountaineering, actually, it's better to, to consider when you've got down again, because often getting off a mountain is harder than getting up it. So that sense of freedom and peace at completion when you are off the mountain is comparable to that sense of, of, of fulfillment that you get on completion of a building, which has mm -hmm. gone well. Um, 
So th 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 that's a start with Pioneer Nature Method. And I've put some sort of sketches in, yeah. uh, a plan, a sketch and a render, which start to pick up on part of our um, Pioneer Nature Method on a particular project, um, which we can talk about. Yeah. Also further on, I think another question you raise raises about that project. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to say you say about completion as well, and you have this sort of sense of fulfillment when you've come down from a mountain. I'm going to ask you next, my next questions about rock climbing, um, but I, before we do that, I want to want you to talk about the sketches that you sent, so we can so people can understand the, the images that you've um, you've uh, yeah. accompanying this. Um, but I, when you say about that fulfillment, um, kind of a, I suppose in a bit of a sort of surreal way, but when you've when you walk around a beautiful space, when you're working in a in a in a beautifully designed, you know, beautiful architecturally designed space, you do have a sense of completion when you've, you know, you've gone, you've you've walked around the building, you know, you've walked around an atrium. You kind of feel like there's also that sense of exploration, isn't there? You know, and there's also what we talk about in biophilic design, this whole, you know. Um, a little bit of intrigue that we need you know going oh, where does this go and where does that go curves and lines and light and you know colors and darkness and light and how it changes um and then when you finish it you feel you feel complete you feel like you've achieved something so um that's also a um a sort of a natural nature um sort of a method as well isn't it really uh, absolutely absolutely yeah um the images that you've um, you've got there can you can you maybe explain what they are um, so there are three under this question, aren't there? There's one which is a plan, which yep. is a kind of a site analysis with a very crude, loose form um, placed over the site. Um, then there is a collage sketch, uh, and then there is a, a, a thirdly a render. And it's really to show the three images are related in that you see this step by step process towards resolution. Um, the render being the most resolved. Just curious. I mean, so you mean people who are not architects, the first one, for instance, there's this sort of yeah. sketch. That's obviously you've looked at a, um, a, a landscape and I mean, maybe you can sort of just just talk through that concept. You know, you, you went to the space, you saw the landscape and, you know, what, what went through your head? How did you decide where you were going to place the building, where you're going to place the pathways? But what, what's the... Is it something that's just um, that just calls to you? Um, is it like a very creative process? And then you obviously you have to apply engineering and and all that sort of stuff on top of it. But how how does it work for you? Can you kind of just explain maybe the feeling and sort of conjure that process? So imagine if you're just like you were going to walk, you've just gone to the space first time. What would you? How would you go about? What would you feel? Sure. Well, the first thing to say is is very broadly, it is a combination. It's a combination of intuition. Mm. Of, of first experiences and then analysis you know desktop analysis maybe on, further on-site analysis and then ultimately engineering input um, before you really coalesce the ideas but the intuition is very important and actually this sketch this first sketch is very much intuitive mm. um, very quickly the experience of the site as existing is a very barren site it's an equestrian site uh, with a large external manege which has zero biodiversity. They've destroyed the ground. Mm. You know, there's no bugs, there's no grass, there's no flowers, uh, there's no butterflies. Um, it's on the edge of ancient woodland, so it should have huge potential for biodiversity. And then they've put hu huge, great, uh, nasty, coniferous, um, alien coniferous trees as a screen to hide this sort of ugly uh, situation because okay the manage itself is, is if you like ground level with a fence around it but then around that you've got these rather ramshackle stables mm. uh, and then you've got accommodation for some of the stable hands which includes caravans even converted containers oh and sorts of mucky stuff and this this land is barren and yet sits on the edge of uh, of an oasis or a a fountain of, of, of you know biodiversity with the ancient wood yeah. um so you know how do we restore this and i felt intuitively as you'll see in the sketch that a wavy form mm. uh, and i'm not i'm not someone who goes for curves particularly you know it's the sort of thing that first year architecture students do because they think they want to be different and it's clever and so on but if you, if you ever put curves in a building they they should have a meaning you know mm not just something to do because it looks pretty. 
Um, so, but I kind of felt there was something about a wave here, a, a, a curve. And um, yes, indeed, the curve enables the, the sinuous curve, um, double curve, the S, if you like, mm -hmm. enables you to create intimate spaces on two sides, two aspects of the building, the one more secluded by the ancient woodland, the other facing southwest, which will catch a lot of sun. So already you're playing with qualities that can exist on this site and drawing out those qualities. But then very interestingly, later on in research, we came across um, the symbolism of a snake in Aboriginal culture. Okay. And a snake is a very powerful symbol in Aboriginal culture. And it's tied to healing of the land, continuity, and uh, particularly connected with water. And obviously Aborigines live in a, in a place where water is scant and it's difficult mm. to and one of the problems we have in the Chilterns is barrenness through poor land management and drying up of chalk streams. The chalk streams in the Chilterns are the lifeblood of the Chilterns. They originate on the north escarpment of the Chilterns and they thread their way south towards the River Thames. You've got a number of them, the River Frey, the River Mistborn, uh, the River Gage. There are numerous of them and they all follow this, this sinuous north-south uh, north line down. And our site, it's not that near a stream. It's quite close to Truffles and Jars, which is the River Mistborn. It's actually very close to a well um, just off the site, which has a link to an underground stream. So my, my point is here, we're starting to tie into the bigger picture of what the Chilterns are, but we'll talk about that later because I think you, you wanted to talk about that project a bit more. Mm -hmm. to touch that later. Yeah. Um, then the other two images were just developing that idea. The cloister is a way that, you know, since time immemorial, uh, as as designers, we've used a way of connecting a building to its surroundings, mm -hmm. uh, to nature, and giving you that opportunity that you were talking earlier of perambulating and meditating in, in, in walk meditation, if you like, mm -hmm. and calming through um, being engaged with with, with nature. Um, and then the render is is a, is is a kind of a resolution of that uh, cloister and showing two people talking. Um, as, as you would in a space like that. Mm. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, again, I encourage people do to have a look at these images. As I said they're on the Journal of Biophilic Design and they're on the YouTube channel. So you can watch this um, uh, podcast actually on YouTube and you'll be able to see these images. And it's that's beautiful how you've created the light coming through the sort of screen almost or these like slats sort of things. I can't remember to describe mm -hmm. it, but it's, it's like being under the... Um, branches of a tree that same kind of diffu light diffusion that comes through um and you've got this lovely view um, of the greenery and the plants and and everything and it's like light and air and lots of natural wood and you know it's like sort of biophilic design tick 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 <laughs> um so really an, an inspiring inspiring space um i i do want to talk about your rock climbing experiences um so yeah well. Oh, yeah, exactly. I know. I know. It's. I know you've, you've mentioned it a few times here, and I know it's really, really um, close to your heart and to your essence and to your being. Um, I love walking. Um, we just went recently down to um, Cornwall and uh, down on the Lizard, and you've got these the the rocks um, that come up from you know that have come up from the centre of the earth, and when you look at it and the water's flowing over it, you have just this really. It's a primal connection to our planet our earth the like the beating heart the fire of uh, the insides of our of our planet and you know um it does and it's really important that we connect to nature in so many different ways you know whether it's just going on holiday or whether you know we can bring that into our built environment which is what we're obviously all trying to do um and i and that is for me it's that close connection to nature it's that sort of um, um communication with nature can you explain the rock, rock climbing for you um it's such an intense experience and you know i mean i've i've done a little bit of it and it's and it's almost like the smell of the rock as well you're kind of looking at it's just yeah can you just can you explain to someone who's not done it the yeah. feeling that you get um yeah. and sort of what it's well, firstly that's that's beautifully put and and cornwall is is great and it's very good for rock climbing actually you're talking about the rock you described there mm. uh, there's some very good sea cliff climbing around the lizard and also towards land's end in in west penworth okay. um, and it's lovely granite rock as well um which is a beautiful rock to climb um but yeah so let's talk about so for me i love rock climbing but i also love probably even more ice climbing and the reason for that is ice climbing is more ephemeral more yeah more exciting 
because of that. You know, a nice face that's there one day might not be there the next day or a particular climb that involves ice might be there one day and not the next. And certainly one season it might be there and another season it might not. Whereas, you know, established rock climbs are, are, are basically there. They're a bit like, you know, this reference to semi-permanence of architecture, you know, over, over a very long period. It's, it's more permanent. Um, so the ephemerality for me in mountaineering and ice climbing is, is particularly exciting. But rock climbing, I mean, is, is so what is it about rock climbing? Um, yes, you, you describe a kind of a heartbeat, don't you, of, of the heartbeat of, of the planet somehow. Um, I think you, you, you've mentioned to me before. And it's, it's about feeling connected. For me, it's about feeling connected with gravity, geology and weather, mm -hmm. okay? which, are, which are three primal elements if you like or forces um that we all have to deal with and architects have to deal with yeah um, i think as architects we, we learn how to deal with landscape um as a climber you're forced into that engagement you know literally in the absolute moment you're adapting to the gravity situation your body position on the rock um, pulling on a particular hole, you might be pulling on a tiny rock crystal, um, you know, in granite or, or hand jamming your hand into a crack. Um, and, you know, the weather might be having an effect. It might be a, a muggy day, it might be quite humid and therefore the rock is, is, is a bit uh, more slippy than usual. Um, there might be a storm coming in, so you have to move quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so as a climate, literally in the moment, you're adapting to these conditions and, and you're finding a solution to the problem you face in that very moment. And you can only think about that very moment. You can't think about getting to the next belay ledge. You have to think about the move you're on. Mm. And that, to me, is very special. Um, it's the only thing I think I've found yeah in in life where you are so in the moment and have to be yeah because you can't afford not to be yeah um, yeah you, you've sent you've sent a couple of photos which i'm going to put on the thing as well and it looks looks incredibly um thrilling scary immediate um yeah just essential really yeah. um you know yeah. Um, it's, it's not for everybody, but I suppose it's it, 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 it's life experience to a to an extreme. Yeah. And, you know, this sense of, of I mean, I feel you can't really live life unless you take it to the edges. Um, yeah. Other people don't feel that, but, you know, which is fine. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I, you know, I think it's important to see what your parameters are in life. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think once we realize we can always we push ourselves you know, whether that's anything, that could be even educational experience. It could be something that you think, oh, I can't sit that exam or I can't, I can't, I can't go to that next level. Or I can't, you know, if you're, you know, if you're recovering from an illness or something like that, you think, oh, I can't, I can't actually try, try, be stubborn, you know, push yourself. We, we were amazing beings. We're amazing machines. Humans are amazing machines. And we're you know, adaptable. Even, yeah, very, we're very adaptable. Much more, so than, much more so than we we think in our conscious minds. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's actually reconnecting with yourself. And when you've experienced it, like even like you're saying, you know, even if you're just going for a walk, you know, or you're going through doing a long distance walk, I, mean, I love doing that. And you sometimes you think I'm never going to get to the end of this thing. <laughs> Your legs start aching and you do it and you just have this great yeah. sense of achievement and um, empowerment as well. And it inspires you for so many things. And you don't worry. It puts everything else into perspective. And also puts, you know, um, you know, if, if, for instance, if you're a business owner and you're thinking, oh, I don't want all these elements in my in my building. Actually, you can. You can be pioneering. You can, um, as you to coin your phrase, you can pioneer a new workplace. You can pioneer a new healthcare facility. You can pioneer a new city. Why not? You know, push yourself, push your team, push your um your families push everybody to to be the best you can be and and we are we are amazing resilient creatures and um i think i think what you you know the because we, we spoke before as well also when, when we met um prior to this podcast um about gravity um and there's this sort of um there's you you gravity and um i'm just just looking at my notes here the sort of the feeling of the earth the pull of the earth um and sort of geology and things yeah. do you do you find that you have having had all these sort of close experiences with rocks um, and natural materials that that also informs what you include and how you include things in in your 
you know, your sort of uh, designs. I think it does, but I think it's unconscious, mm. <clears throat> you know, and, and I think a combination, as I say, a combination of climbing and meditating and my, you know, my experience in meditation. Yeah. Uh, climbing uh just influences me unconsciously I, I don't i don't deliberately try unless someone's particularly asking me right well you need a meditation center or something or yeah. or we want you know a mountain refuge mm. uh, those two i would love to i've not designed <laughs> it, and i would love to um but uh i think i so yes i think it is informing but it's not something i need to try because it's just with me it's me yeah. it's it's there so it comes through yeah. exactly I think that's it. I think that's also something that's coming through when I'm in different people I'm interviewing, where they're trying to take architects, particularly, or interior designers out into nature so that they have this inherent feeling. Um, and then that lives with us. You're, you're doing it every day. That's part of you. So just naturally, you're going to be designing because you have this understanding and it pervade, you know, it's all pervasive within your body and within your conscious and, you know, within your creative creativity. It just comes out in you um, and that the spaces are amazing. Um, I mean, maybe we could talk about the, the post-production studios in Chilterns that you're, you're going to be you're sort of designing. Um, it is absolutely, it's fluid, it's in harmony with the earth. Um, obviously, you, you spoke about it just, just a little while ago. Um, but how have you gone about designing it? You know, what are sort of the main aspects that you wanted to include in the design? Maybe you could, because there's, there's another plan that I'm going to show in the... Um, in the images that's on Indeed. the YouTube. I mean, what's useful is the, the, the question we were back on earlier when you were asking me about Pioneer Nature Method. Yeah. Those three images um, were of this project at an yeah. earlier stage. We've now progressed it further. So this is a nice continuity. And, and I think um, people watching this can see this. In, in a way, this is the main project I'm talking about. So, mm. you know, see how it unfolds. Um, so I think the first thing to say about this project is the client has a rare vision. Mm -hmm. um, which is what you need uh, if you want to be creative in architecture. You have to have uh, a client with vision um, and trust and patience. Um, he wants to break from the industry norm, his industry norm. Um, and he, well, what's he want to do? He wants to create post-production studios um, uh, that live in and with the landscape okay mm. which is quite extraordinary okay we are seeing some movement of film from central london and leavesden outwards mm. i think a lot of that is simply to do with space and convenience and accessibility uh, my client's vision is not just that in fact, it's not really that. It's much more about creating this sense of well-being and living with the landscape. Oh. Uh, so for me, it's it's perfect client really. How mm -hmm. can these studios live with nature? Yeah. Um, and this has empowered us at Atelier um, to. Uh, yeah, to delve into our, our, our process, our, what, what's important to us, which obviously reconnection with nature and, and, um, and interpret. First of all, what is this particular site, which I've already described to you as being very barren. It's, um, uh, it's um, you know, a question centre which, uh, uh, which has eroded the landscape. Mm. Uh, so the first thing is to understand what, what is that site and, and more, more importantly, what is its potential um, so that's on the one hand, understanding the site um, and perhaps extending it broader to the children's, you know, what is children genius loci, okay? Uh, but then the other aspect is what is film? You know, what yeah. is film? What is film? Um, well, I mean, for me, film is storytelling, flowing, unfolding, which plays very well into the biophilic and pioneer nature method of journey. Mm. And it's one of the reasons why we developed that wavy form to start with before we'd done any further research on snake and mm -hmm. so um, And of course, it, 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 it permits this uh, very interesting cloister relationship mm -hmm. curve through the landscape. Um, and yeah, so it's, it, it, we, we did a lot of research and analysis on this. Um, the other thing 
we found is it's, it's near one of the child fonts in children's and the word child font means chalk child is chalk and font is a uh, fountain or spring so it means chalk spring yeah. and this of course ties us to the current state of the children's and chalk streams drying up and the fact that these were seen as not that long ago maybe in the 14 1500s you know these places of of life of of stream um and and wells and springs um so it's it's tapping into that which is then where this aboriginal symbolism of the snake really started to to make some sense um what else is important on this site and in a lot of my buildings is geometry mm -hmm. geometry is both on the micro scale of the building itself but it's also the macro scale of going out into the landscape um i do work with geomancers the geomancers are the western equivalent of um kind of the western equivalent of feng shui um experts um and it's about um positioning your building in the landscape in a way that will uh, encourage the well-being of the landscape but also the people inside it will lead to prosperity and so on uh, mm -hmm. i know a lot of architects are skeptical about it but i'm i'm open to it it's not something i am fixed on i think any site and brief is is very very complex and you have to take numerous factors into consideration but geomancy plays a role so in in um this particular site in the child font um we found some very interesting geomantic connections with ley lines um through the hidden rivers of westminster through windsor great drive through hatfield house through several saxon churches which were creating some very interesting lines and axes on the site and we have we have used some of that and where it's departed from what we want we've we've departed from it the great thing about order uh is to know when to break from it to mm -hmm. use it then yeah. no because geometry is obviously rigid and you can't you can't just rigidly use geometry it drive you mad <laughs> but uh, uh, you know to use it in part suggestively and and then knowing when to break it is 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 delightful and i think that's often where great architecture exists yeah uh, yeah, it's. I think um, just looking at the plan that you've got there that I'm going to show on the on the Journal of Bifurcate Design uh, website, which accompanies this podcast, and also on the YouTube channel, which you can watch alongside. Um, it's it's like I don't know. I'm now I'm looking at it again because you showed me this um, when we met, but it looks a bit like a cochlea. It looks a bit like an ear. So I'm. Oh, seeing, oh yes. Yeah. yeah. So now I'm I'm seeing. I'm obviously seeing the the kind of that S shape is like a piece of film. Obviously, me working in film and 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 sort of old school, to, you know, media. We, <laughs> obviously, we used to cut the film, you know. And so it, it reminds me of that how it kind of like snakes down and it's got that sort of width and and stuff. Um, but the actual the way the the garden in front, you've got like a circular bed and then these like loops that go around, um, yes. which is so pleasing and um, organic. Um, um, and what, what a lovely walkway for people to kind of just go and, and just unwind and it looks like you've got little anchor points around as well with their seats or whatever so that will draw people around the space um, it's a it's a stunning stunning location and um, yeah I'll have to come and photograph it when it's uh, when it's complete so um, back to the image I mentioned right at the beginning of the Louis Kahn um, art museum yes Texas, that that just the place to be um, yeah. You know, I suppose so, so, some of that is 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 coming through uh, subliminally. Um, yeah, yeah, wonderful. Um, can you talk a little bit about the materials um, that you use and and sort of how you sort of morph them into mimicking nature patterns? Um, and you've um, you've we spoke about this eco uh, eco sanctuary, uh, sort of a concept for an eco sanctuary in Uganda. I've worked yeah. in Uganda a lot, as some people might know who are listening to this. Um, but it's like a sort of checkerboard effect that you've got where you're using mm -hmm. alternative bricks to create this sort of natural airflow. Um, yes. Can you tell us about a little bit about the different patterns of nature? I'm, I'm going to put the picture up alongside um, when you're when you're speaking uh, so that people yes. can see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think what, when we talked about this before, you, you said, do I have any favourite methods or materials or patterns that I like to adopt yeah and yeah. um the answer to that is no particular favorites it's it's really about sense of place so wherever you're building whether it's Uganda whether it's Uxbridge whether it's Chilterns whether it's Scotland whether it's 
wherever it is, it's about interpreting that uh, material sense of place. Yeah. And then playing with that really in terms of uh, the, the mimicry. Um, but probably the most I've worked with and the most I've done is with brick and with timber. Okay. So in brick, um, both for Uganda, which is still a concept design, although it's got a nice render, which people can see later. Um, and um, uh, a project I'm doing in Uxbridge, um, I've used hit and miss brick. Okay. Which is a, a very nice pattern that lets a light, you know, plays with light um, and creates very nice shadows. Um, and then in timber, how I've done it is typically with rain screen cladding, where I've um, changed the dimension of the cladding baton, perhaps had three different sizes of cladding baton, and then created a pattern, a repetitive pattern on the elevation through, um, you know, this different size of cladding pattern and probably having a gap. So you have a shadow gap. Um, so um, the actual waterproof membrane of the of, of the elevation is is behind so rain can actually get through the battens and then it, it falls against the membrane and, and, and falls down but so you create this 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 rather lovely almost ephemeral screen mm -hmm. of bats with a gap between them and those batten sizes might vary and that creates some lovely patterns so those are the two um that i've worked on the most but i i would be uh, delighted to have an opportunity to work with metal in the same way, you know, appropriately, and 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 any other materials um, as mm. well, depending on the, the, the place. Yeah, mm. I think um, when I when you showed me the pictures and obviously what I'm looking at here as well, um, I just I, I I do love that. I love that, and I, I love the I love that it's called hit and miss brick. <laughs> I think that's just such a great, great sort of, I mean, it sounds like it's sort of wrong, but it's, but it's, you know what I mean? Hit and miss sounds like hit and miss. I love it, but it's, it's what the, the, the effect it creates is a sort of like, again, like when you're under a tree on a sunny day and it's, it's creating this lovely filtered light that comes through and an airflow as well. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fasc always fascinated by how you can create natural airflow um, with, shapes and and sort of and stuff but also with these and i think when i when i was working out in uganda and i've worked out there quite a bit and in kenya um particularly um is that how they make use of you know sometimes it's better than others you know but when you're really out in the in the bush how naturally you know they've got no access to electricity how naturally they create these sort of voids and spaces and you know you're going into like their huts and it's cool um because of that it's like often circular design um, so, you know, sometimes a little recess and, and it lets the air through. You think it's just so clever and it's intuitive. Um, and it's lovely to see how you're um, using your intuition as well, um, as well as beauty and sort of and also innovation and 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 really creative design as well to kind of pull all these um, essential elements together. I think they're, they're really, really lovely. Um, and um, yeah, you know, with lovely views and things as well. So. Uh, so thanks. Um, so just as a sort of, um, there's, there's two final questions. One is the, the one that I ask everybody, but before we do that, for you, why is biophilic design important? Uh, it's very simple. It's important um, uh, because it, we have to reconnect people with nature or we won't survive. There you go, that's it, thank you. Um, and then the final question. <laughs> um the final question really which um as I, I think is my favorite bit of this podcast really but you know, if you could paint the world with a with a sort of magic brush of biophilia what would it look like for you that's a fantastic question um you know what does biophilia look like and i i, I would answer that by saying well very abstract I, a colleague and I have thrown something together, which you can add as an image at the end, which has taken a series of inspirational images, Mark Rothko painting, an Irma Blank painting, one of our projects, a Van Dyke painting, and one other painting, I've forgotten the name of the painter, and, and put it together. Um, uh, so abstractly, it's about light, it's about dark, it's about order, it's about chaos, it's about water, it's about people, it's about conflict, it's about resolution. Um, 
And yes, it's about, ultimately, I suppose I'm an optimist. So it is about uh, order that presides over chaos. Um, although I quite like the extreme balance being a climber, you know, I like to take that sense of chaos and order <laughs> right as far as possible. Because I don't really like order. I don't really, you know, <laughs> I, I don't like it. So it, 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 it's, it's, it's not constraining, but it's just that guiding, but it's, 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 um, you know, the real challenge in life is to have balance and stability within continual change. And that, you know, I think for me, it, it, it's that. And I think, as I say, ultimately a sense of, 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 of resolution has, has, has to be, yeah. yeah. Thank you for listening to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast.